Um, you guys know a few weeks ago I said that I, I firmly believe that this is a house of healing. And I said, God dwells in this house. There's no doubt in my mind. Too many things with too many people has happened. Um, we all know back row, back, back row boy John. Um, he's, he's been going through it with health. He's got kidney problems. He has cancer, um, Parkinson's, and so forth. And, you know, he's talked to me about it, and I've prayed with him about it, and I, I talked to him this morning about it. So I'm going to give you a God report, not a man report, a God report. So last week, he had two doctor's appointments. One was with his cardiologist. The other one with the, was his cancer specialist. Cardiologist appointment came and went, and he got the good news that he doesn't have a heart problem any longer. <laughs> then he went to the doctor about his, is it Hodgkin's? Hodgkin's cancer, and they ran the tests and did everything, and I'm proud to say that John is also cancer-free. So you can't tell me that God can't do what man, God can do what man, man can't. We've proven it with Ted, with Joni, with Sheriff um, Wayne. John, Bernie, John, all of them. This truly is, whether you accept it or you don't accept it, this is a house of healing. And a lot of pastors can come up and shoot their mouths off and say, yeah, this happened and this happened and this happened. If anybody else out there doesn't believe this, I'll do something that nobody else will do. I will show you medical proof. That way you can just shut up and go about your business. How's that? Christmas season, Luke 2. It's uh, during the Christmas season. I'll shave your head. <laughs> Luke 2 will probably be the most read passage in Scripture. It's a well known story that Jesus, uh, the story that tells of Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus, the angel's announcement to the shepherds in the fields, the shepherd's visit to the stable and even Jesus' childhood. This chapter of the New Testament tells the age-old Christmas story, but it's also extremely relevant to our lives today. And if you could want to read along with me, Luke 2, 1, 21. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree, decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census taken by the new governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own towns to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judah to Bethlehem to the town of David because he belonged to the house of David and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child that was of immaculate conception. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes And placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people today in the town of David. A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on peace on earth, goodwill. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger when they had seen him. They spread. Something is burning over here. For real, something's burning. Really? 
you know what? Uh, somebody go check the coffee pot. The shepherd, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that had been heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Now, here's five takeaways from Luke 2 that we can apply to our life today. One, even Jesus wasn't about simple circumstances. When you think of kings, you think of crowns, you think of thorns, you think of uh, or thrones, you think of palaces, um, not stables full of smelly animals and feces. That's not how you think a, a king would be brought into the world. A trough does a bed for a newborn baby. Yet kings, yet Jesus, who is the king of kings, lord of lords, though he has came into the world in a remarkable, simple, lowly, and unassuming way. His birth was the furthest thing from a king's welcome. Few of us are, are acquainted with the ways of royalty, and it's not even fathomable how elaborate and how exquisite that lifestyle would be. Many of us, however, can describe in detail what a barn's like. Most of us has been in one. Yeah. I find this part of the Christmas story the, the most beautiful part for God. God brought Jesus down to be humble. He brought him down not only to be a sacrifice to us, but to be our, basically our legend, you know. He brought him down to show us that not everything is what you see. You know, the old Hank Williams Jr. song, Don't Judge a Book by the Cover. Those people that would see this lonely child in a barn with animals above him in the, in the manger, in a, in a law, in a watering hole probably, because it would have been dry at the time. They see him laying. You wouldn't ever think that that guy is the guy. That guy is the guy that's going to change the world. That guy is the reason for every December 25th season. That guy's presence is the reason for this season, not the presence under the tree, the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That guy is the reason why people get healed. Because that guy gave us faith. That guy gave us grace. That guy that was born in a manger in those conditions to poverty-stricken parents is that guy that we worship today, someone that we all can relate to, somebody who never judged anybody for anything, somebody that looked at everybody and said, you know, even though you like Biden, I'll forgive you. And, um, but better days are coming. I'm teasing. I, I think it's that guy that gave us our free will to do good things in life. He gave us the reason that we can look at each other and say, I'm heaven bound, and I'm heaven bound because of what happened up there. But see, before the cross happened, birth had to happen. Before all the sacrifices and the pain and the agony, I won't say the rest, Cindy and Kelsey. Before all of that happened, he had to go through birth. And his birth wasn't even easy. So anybody that can sit and think that Jesus took the easy way out from birth to death, that is the absolute farthest thing from the truth. He sacrificed from the giddy-up so that we could be free from sin. Amen? Amen? He was dependent on his parents like everyone else. Everything about his very beginnings life on earth was humbling and unassuming. Giving us a Savior we can easily relate to and understand. Not one who is distant or on some kind of a mansion someplace on a hill. He didn't have, and Joseph and Mary didn't have prestigious job titles. The only job title Joseph had was he was going to be married to Mary. The job title that Mary had, the angel gave her, you are highly blessed among women. That was their titles. Other than that, they were unassuming, lived uneventful lives that God looked down and said, I'm going to use you too. And that's been my point for going on four years up in this church. And I will reiterate that today. Why not you? 
God looked down out of all the people on the earth. He looked down on every living being and said, you and you. He could have said, you and you. He could have said, anybody else out in the field. He's deliberate. God is deliberate what he wants. He knew from the beginning of time who he was going to pick, why he was going to pick, and what was going to happen. He knew when Jesus was going to come. He knew when Jesus was going to die. He knew at that particular time, we as mankind needed a Savior, and we needed it desperately, and he provided. Amen? I feel like Bob Seeger up here. Turn the page. <clears throat> God's glory is worthy of our praise, even when we feel afraid. When the angel of the Lord stood before the shepherds who were keeping watch over their sheep during the night, verse 9 says, they were terrified, and you would be too. If you saw an angel, or if God came down in living form and told you something, you'd run for the mountains. You would run because you, at first, your first reaction would be to be scared, to be terrified, to be shocked. And then your next reaction is going to be a human reaction of, I'm not worthy. If God deems you worthy, you're worthy. And there's nothing you can say or do about it. It's just the way it is. Amen? Even though they were afraid, and probably trying to make sense of what they were seeing and hearing, wondering if they were dreaming or if this was really happening, the angel's first words were calming to them. Do not be afraid. And to the congregation here this morning and to all the people out there watching, I say this to you today. Do not be afraid to call yourself a Christian. Do not be afraid to let someone this season, there's one more day to shop. That's today. If you know somebody that needs something that can't, if you know a child that, from a family that needs something and, and, and they can't, if you know a family that can't have a meal, you have, don't do it until after you leave church. But after church today, you have half a day to not to be afraid to go show, show somebody grace and love in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not too late to be the epitome of what this season is for. The season is forgiving. It's forgiving and forgiving. It's about life and letting people know what you know about how to live life through the grace and the faith that Jesus Christ gave us with his birth. Amen? When the, when the Lord makes a promise, we can trust he will keep it. The shepherds heard from the angel that the baby had been born, and they didn't doubt it. <clears throat> Verse 15 says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They heard the message and immediately acted upon it. And that's another thing. If you think you're hearing from God, don't second-guess yourself. Go act on it. Go let God know that you're hearing him clearly. Don't be the status quo and try to talk yourself out of it. Don't be the status quo and say, well, we'll wait and see what happens. He picked you for a specific reason. Act upon it. Think, they're out, you know, there's no street lamps out where they were. You know, it was just the stars. And they see this, and they see that star. And they see these angels, and, and they hear the Lord. you got to know how scared they were. They think their wine was painted or something. You know? But they did immediately what was asked of them. They didn't hesitate. A lot of our problems in society and a lot of our problems with us is that we're afraid. We're afraid to act upon things. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If Benjamin Franklin was afraid, he wouldn't have put that key in a jar and flew that kite, now would he? He wouldn't. If all of our brave women and men that fought for this country to keep it a country under God were afraid, we would have lost both world wars. But like I said two weeks ago, world wars, America, 2-0. and 0. 
Everybody else, 0 and 2. That's because of courage. That's because of strength. And that's because knowing that God's walking with you. Amen? Words from and about the Lord are to be treasured. When the shepherds visited Mary and Joseph and the baby in the manger, verse 17 and 18 says, they spread the word concerning what they had been told them about this child and who they heard it, and it was, they were amazed that the shepherds said to them, I can't even imagine what this shepherd story must have been, but I know it must have been powerful, and I know it must have been sincere, and I know it must have been beautiful, and I know it must have been anxiety-ridden, but not the anxiety of dread, doom, and stress, the anxi anxi anxiety of euphoria, the anxiety of feeling bliss and powerful in that situation. It's one of those, I know something you don't know, and they wanted to tell everybody, and they did. Got them in trouble too, but they did it. Herod. His mother treasured up all these things in her heart. After Jesus was found in the temple, learning from the teachers, the things Mary heard about her son and the things she saw him doing were beautiful treasures to her, and they should be for us as well. The story we have in Scripture tells us about a Jesus who is, how he was, how he lived, how he thought. He went there to learn from people at a very, very young age. Don't be afraid to learn. No matter what your age is, that, that junk about you can't teach an old dog new tricks, you can. They just got to be willing to learn it and to listen. He did on this earth, and we should hold them dear in our hearts too. We, we should hold what Jesus did dear in our hearts. From a young man, his, his mother found him in the temple praying and preaching. Why? He explained it. I'm doing my father's work. He knew from a young age his calling and his anointing. Some of you don't learn until a lot older. Some of the, some of the um, prophets didn't learn until older. God uses you. I mean, it may take 15 years before he comes to you. But he'll come to you because that means the time's right. You should make time <clears throat> to learn from these older than us. <clears throat> there ain't a whole lot older than me. But Jesus did this as a child in the, in the temple, painting a beautiful picture for us. Jesus, the all-knowing and all-powerful Son of God, yet even sat among the temple's teachers and rabbis, listened, asked questions, and learned. In Luke verse 47, it says, Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Verse 52 says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. He knew as a boy that the elders had wisdom, and he could grow from it if he sought them out to learn. We should do the same. We should seek advice and knowledge from those who are more mature and knowledgeable in their faith. We can learn so much more from mentors. Pastor Carter will tell you he comes into the office. I, I still to this day, him and I theologically talk about things. I hope he learns a few things, and I do learn a few things. That's the way David Wilkerson was. I pick up the phone, and, and he'd just go get it. Those old dogs, the W.A. Criswells of the world and the Billy Grahams, they didn't care about what society thinks. They thought what God thought and what God thinks of them. And, uh, you know, Billy Graham did a sermon that said, who is the historical Jesus? And they goes into Luke. It says that he was one of the most, if not the most, modest and humble man to ever walk this planet. We should all try to learn from that example of modesty and humility on how to lead our lives and how to serve God at all times. Jesus knew when he died he was going back up to heaven. He was going to go back up and sit on a throne. He knew that. But he also knew he had a job to do. And no matter what it took, he went through an immense amount of pain. He went through poverty. He went through an immense amount of pain. He, he went through beatings. He went through the thorn on his head. He went through crucifixion, mocking. Those things had to happen. And then he was resurrected. And we'll talk about that at the end of March. Christmas is love. 
1 John 4, 9 says, God showed how much He loved us by sending His Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. Christmas is giving. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give a life of ransom for many. Matthew 20, 28. Psalms 103, 1. Christmas is healing. He forgives all my sins and heals all of my diseases. Revelation 21, 4. Christmas is wiping away every tear. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Christmas is truth. In Psalms 119, 160, the entirety of your word is truth, O God. Christmas is believing. John 14, 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me also. No matter how we wrap it or the content inside, no present in all of creation will ever top that. The birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will never be topped. From his youth until his death, from his birth till death, we've learned so many things, how to live our lives, how to prepare our lives, how to be good and faithful servants of an almighty God, how to never take anything for granted, how to love and forgive, how to accept and move forward, how to know that your past was nothing more than an instrument of the grace, power, and mercy that God has for a great faith-based future that you can do anything with. Amen? And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm here to tell you He is the best gift you'll ever receive from a heart that needed it. Now I share with you the hope and the prayer that maybe this Christmas you will receive him too. If you personally know Jesus, I pray you find your gift to give. Maybe it's reaching out to someone who doesn't yet know the love of our Savior. Maybe it's helping out a neighbor or a friend or finally saying yes to what God has been calling you to do. That would be one of the most important gifts you could give God. Tell God, yes, I know what you're calling me for and I'm ready. Or quite possibly, this is your season to just be, to be loved. How about that? To be cared for. To be taken a meal when you were hungry and had nothing. To be cherished by someone because you loved them and you wanted to be reciprocated to you. Just to be held because you feel lonely and, and worthless at times. To be prayed for. Because you don't want to pray for yourself, but you know you need it. You're hoping that God will listen to someone else's prayers if it comes from them instead of yourself because you don't want to be selfish. To be free, knowing that your sins have been washed clean. You don't have to do anything else. It was done for you. You were stamped. God's the day he died you were stamped God's to be valuable to know that what you're going through in your life is minuscule compared to what God's got in store for the rest of your life and for eternity in the kingdom of heaven to be important to yourself self-esteem is one of the greatest things that you can have because if you don't love you it's hard for other people to love you too. You become hateful, vengeful, regretful. You ever heard that term, holier than thou? You become holier than thou. You don't accept blessings from God. You try to think of excuses of why it can't be God because you're so miserable inside your own hole, your own heart. Be grateful. Turn around, everybody, and look at everybody. Look at all these people in here. Be grateful for the friends and family that you have. We've had members in this church pass away this year. We've had members in this church in the last three years, unfortunately, pass away that were loved by many of the congregation. Be grateful that you have who you have and know why you have it. When you turned and looked at everyone in this room, have gratitude in your heart that God led you to the Cowboy Church where you can fellowship with a lot of like-minded people 
who love Christ. A lot of like-minded people who cherish the fact that that had they 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 have anxiety. I, I cry over that cross. That's in your heart because it's sincere. You care. Let me tell you something, people. The people that cry about that cross, you don't have to worry about when you get to the pearly gates and God saying, get away from me, I never knew you. God's going to look at you and say, job well done, my good and faithful servant. Now come on in. And then we're going to saddle up and go, aren't we, Wayne? We're going to saddle up and go. Be an inspiration. Be an inspiration for people that were in your position before in life. Be the reason why they're not going to take that next pill or they're not going to take that next shot or lift that next bottle. They're not going to raise their fist and hit their spouse or their children because anyone that would hit a woman or a child is not even a man in the first place. They're just a little sissy wimp that doesn't have a heart or a soul. They're a bully. Be that person that can inspire someone that they'll never have to do that again because there is something better and something greater, and that is called faith and grace through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven. Amen? When you leave this church today, I pray you feel so loved by God for this season that we made it this far, that this church is growing, man. You guys are so cool and I'm just blessed to be a small part of it, and that's the truth. And whatever it is that Christ may bring you or God may bring you this year, I pray that your, that your heart come to know the true meaning of the season. And the true meaning in this season isn't about trees that are lit up like the, the star of David. The true meaning of this season isn't poinsettias or blow-ups in your yard or the turkey dinner. Um, the true meaning of this season is the gratitude of why we celebrate it. And that's Jesus Christ. The true meaning of this season is about love and commitment to not only each other, but to an almighty God. Make a commitment with God before you leave this church today that you are going to be what 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. You're going to be a new creature, a new creation. You're going to be bellowed in the anointing of God. This church has been anointed. There's no doubt. You're going to go out and receive a gift from God that's going to allow you to freely talk to other people, to help even more people come to this church. You're not going to be afraid to say, I go to the cowboy church and I'm a Christian. Why don't you come with me? We've got work to do, people. We have work to do. I've never preached a sermon on end times but there's a beginning and there's an end to everything. Wake up, America. Let's do something great for God. And normally I end my sermons with you guys screaming, cowboy up. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to end my sermon in prayer. So if everyone could just bow their head, <clears throat> it could be five seconds or it could be five minutes. I don't God, we come to you today with the humblest of hearts, Lord. We pray that you touch every single person inside the Cowboy Church and the one and a half million people or so that are watching this online. I pray that you touch their hearts, Lord, and take out the greed, take out the anger, take out the animosity. I pray that you place in their heart what this season is all about, Lord. It's about love. It's about forgiving and giving. It's about knowing the true meaning of this season, and that is the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you give helping, healing hands to everyone in pain. I pray, Lord, that you bring somebody to the rescue of those people that have not. There's still time, this Lord, to let the children know that God is alive and well, and Jesus Christ is alive and well. Not only was he born, he was risen, Lord, and there's a lot in between that we need to teach the youth of this country, Lord, so that we can bring them back to you. I pray that everybody knows the true meaning of Christmas. Christmas was meant to be Christmas for us to come and worship together. But not just to worship in this church, Lord, but to worship in our own homes. Not just to worship in a church in our homes, but to worship in our own heart, mind, body, and soul, Lord.
to bring praise, glory, gratitude, and love to you at all times, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, so that we can become saved, sanctified, justified, and rectified in everything that we say and do, Lord, so that your anointing, your presence, your love, your sincere love, and your healing, and your power can be felt by everybody listening to this today, Lord. We pray all of this in our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 See you guys. Merry Christmas.